Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Thursday, June 1st, so happy June and happy almost Friday. And last day of school for some districts here in San Antonio, right? Yeah, my little one's her last day at, uh, with SAISD. Right, and you mentioned another district to me. This North morning. Side. North I Side. That's big, a big one. Biggest yeah. one in the mm -hmm. city, so uh, have a great summer, everybody. Yes, I know. It's going to kind of feel like summer just a little bit, so let's go ahead and check in with Mia, who's here this morning. Good morning. Good morning, and yes, in the meteorological world, it's also the first day of meteorological summer and the first official day of the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. So a lot going on out there this June 1st, including a warm and humid start. Let's take a look at some of those current conditions outside. We're in the 70s across the board here in San Antonio, 74 officially over at SA International, 71 right now at Randolph. As we take a look at the dew points, which is how we measure the moisture and the lower levels of the atmosphere, they are elevated in the 70s for most of us. So you will notice it when you step outside. That's also one of the reasons why we have some of the cloud cover in place right now. And while they are very few and far between, we've seen a few pockets of sprinkles pop up this morning, generally moving in from the south and pushing farther up to the north. Coverage is expected to be very isolated throughout the remainder of this Thursday. After this, just a 10% chance for a very stray shower into the early afternoon. Decreasing clouds like we saw yesterday, temperatures climbing into the upper 80s, close to about 90. So yes, feeling very much like the early portions of June here this afternoon. Into tomorrow and Saturday, more of the same. We'll also introduce some isolated storm chances into the forecast. So we'll talk about that, get you a look at the future cast coming up in just a few. But first, let's ho head over to Stephen for a check of the traffic. Well, Mia, we have been tracking this vehicle fire since 440 this morning on GMSA, but let's get a wider look now at Transguide and show you the developments out there. I received some information from San Antonio Police, and I can tell you now that we know that at least there were, there were no injuries reported uh, earlier this morning. In fact, we know the driver of that cab was able to escape with no injuries, but it was during that cleanup process that a secondary crash occurred involving a motorcycle. Now that cyclist uh, was thrown out in the grass that you could see out there, but uh, thankfully that driver was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. But traffic has been experiencing a lot of trouble out there. You could see from the shot at Transguide, we still have two lanes shut down and right now only one lane remains open. So this is not too far from WW White and you could see that right now now, traffic is moving at 14 miles per hour. It stays uh, has stayed pretty steady for uh, quite a while now, but we're going to keep a close eye on that and hopefully we'll see it clear up here before the show wraps. Not the only issue I'm tracking, though. Unfortunately, we have another crash that was causing a bit of a holdup here along I-10 westbound. It was along the frontage road near Vance Jackson, and earlier there was a big uh, slowdown that was taking place if you were traveling up near Crossroads. Looks like that's already cleared out, so that's better news to report, but uh, other issues are still out there on the roadways. Uh, TxDOT still has this crash reported at 410 eastbound at Callahan Road, and that is a very busy route, so you can see a lot of orange is still out there. Watch out for first responders as they work to clear that up. And we have to take a drive over here to State Highway 151 in the eastbound lanes, not too far from Hunt Lane. You see another crash also reported that's causing a bit of a holdup. Unfortunately, this is an area where there are no trans guide cameras that could show us the conditions, but our map is showing us that yeah, people are still commuting through there with some trouble. Giving you a wide look now at the map, we have a few stalls, and it looks like some road debris along 35 out toward Vaughn Army at 410. Just watch out for that make sure that your commute uh, gets going without any trouble there. But it does look like we are seeing the end of this. Uh, again, this is I-10 East at Loop 410, not too far from WW White Road. We'll continue to watch this very closely and hope for that better update before the show wraps up. Guys. Thank you, Stephen. Here's today's 9 at 9. The debt ceiling drama that's been hovering over Washington for months could be coming to an end soon. Last night, the House of Representatives passed a bill that will prevent a potential default, suspending the nation's debt limit until New Year's Day 2025. The bill now heads to the Senate, where leaders are planning to work quickly with financial markets watching and the Monday default deadline looming. Multiple sources say federal prosecutors have a recording from a meeting where former President Donald Trump admits to having a classified document. The recording was made in 2021 at Trump's golf club in New Jersey. Sources say Trump understood the document was classified and can be heard saying he would like to share it, but was aware of his limitations to declassify it post-presidency. Trump has previously stated he declassified everything and denies any wrongdoing. 
Governor Greg Abbott has appointed former Texas Secretary of State John Scott to be interim attorney general. He will replace Ken Paxton, who was impeached less than a week ago. The Senate trial against Paxton will start by August 28th and will be presided over by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. If Paxton is acquitted by the Senate, he would be reinstated as attorney general. After 10 interest rate hikes in a row, it's looking more like the Federal Reserve may hold the line at this month's meeting. Two key policymakers this week have indicated they favor keeping rates where they are at the meeting in a couple of weeks to get a better handle on how the economy is moving. For the first time in three months, the number of open jobs across the country has gone up. The Labor Department says there were over 10 million openings in April, up from 9.7 million in March. Economists had predicted the number to drop again, but that wasn't the case. The FDA has approved a second RSV vaccine for older adults. The CDC and its vaccine advisors are scheduled to meet later this month to discuss the vaccines pending their recommendations. They could be available for seniors by this fall. Federal regulators want to require automatic braking on all new vehicles. The technology stops or slows down a moving vehicle when a hazard is detected. Many models already come with it, though they're not required to do so. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says the technology is now mature enough to become mandatory. Toyota is set to spend billions in the U.S. on making electric vehicles and now says it will invest another $2.1 billion in a battery factory already under construction in North Carolina. Those batteries will go to a complex in Kentucky where Toyota plans to build its first American-made EV, a new SUV. Today marks the start of Pride Month. Pride Day itself is June 28th. It marks the day in 1969 when police raided a gay club in New York City called the Stonewall Inn. It led customers, staff, and neighborhood residents to riot outside. Protests and clashes continued over six days. Protesters demanded the creation of places where the LGBTQ community could be open about their sexual orientation without having to fear getting arrested. And that is today's Nine at Nine. And the polls are open right now to cast your ballot early in the city's runoff elections. San Antonio residents must decide who they want to represent City Council Districts 1 and 7. Both of those races were too close to call during the general election at the beginning of the month. Today, polls are open until 6 p.m. Early voting ends on Tuesday. And Election Day is next Saturday. That's June 10th. Well, in your morning headlines, NASA says there are explanations for most UFO sightings, but not all. And if you own your student loan, get ready to start paying again at the end of the summer. Plus, a couple of politicians are tired of being crammed into airline seats, and they're ready to do something about it. And how much do you think a wedding will cost you this year? Well, David Sears is here for your wedding planning. One word, elope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll have that for you in a second. But first, the thought of unidentified flying objects and little people coming to Earth from space has been getting attention since the 1950s. There are believers, but most of the time there are explanations. However, it has become such a popular topic, NASA got involved. A panel of scientists and experts on UFOs looked at 800 cases of reported UAPs, or unidentified anomalous phenomena. They came to the conclusion that most of these sightings had a logical explanation. Current U.S. Senator and former astronaut Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space, talked about his experience with a UFO while he was flying an F-14. The guy that sits in the back of the Tomcat was convinced we flew by a UFO. We went to go look at it. It turns out it was Bart Simpson, a balloon. <laughs> and how about this one? In Australia, there were some unexplained radio waves. The experts finally figured it out. Folks would heat up their lunch in a microwave, open the door before the time went off. That caused a burst of radio signals that were picked up by very sensitive equipment. The panel did say there is no answer for 5% of the sightings, so they want the government to collect better data. If you owe money on a federal student loan or know somebody who does, you should be paying attention to the debate in Washington. As we just mentioned earlier, the House of Representatives passed the debt ceiling deal late last night with broad bipartisan support. Now it has the Senate. If they pass it, President Biden just has to sign it. If you have a federal student loan, get ready to start paying up again during COVID. The loan payments were paused. It happened eight times, but that is about to come to an end if the debt deal passes and signed by the president. Folks are going to have to start paying on their loans in August. 
that will affect about 44 million people. And that means with so many different services handling the loans, things could get a little hairy. So loan experts suggest folks who have to pay reach out to the company who services their loan to make sure that first payment gets to where it is supposed to be and on time. Have you flown lately? Maybe over the Memorial Day weekend, did you feel a little cramped in your seat there on the plane? Two Democratic senators think you were, and they want the Biden administration to take a look at the size of seats on commercial planes. Senators Tammy Duckworth and Tammy Baldwin want legislation that would require the FAA to conduct cabin evacuation tests under more realistic conditions, and they want the FAA to update the standards on size and space between seats. One of their concerns, the ability of passengers to evacuate safely during an emergency. Duckworth says the current standard were set back in the 60s. Obviously, times have changed. For one, she says there are more carry-on bags because people can't afford the check bag fees. And carry-on luggage should be taken into account during new testing. The FAA has not commented yet. All right, this is one of the busiest times of year for weddings and with prices the way they are because of the inflation, couples who are about to exchange vows are paying a lot more for the privilege like $29,000. That is only a thousand more dollars than last year though. That is according to the wedding site Zola. If you're getting married in a big city, it could cost you closer to 35 grand. The site surveyed over 4,000 engaged couples and those numbers are the average. Okay, here's some interesting numbers as well. The site says mom and dad are paying for the entire wedding. Only 33% say they are putting up some of their own money and 16% are paying for the entire wedding themselves. So once again, there is a cheap way to do it. You just elope. elope. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. <laughs> Maybe a couple of friends and family, you know, or write a big check. Yes. Mom and dad. Or no, or, or well. you save up and pay it for yourself. Mark and I were talking about how a lot of uh, couples were taking on the expense More themselves. and more, more mm -hmm. and more, absolutely. Steph's going to start with her piggy bank now for Rooney's uh, wedding one day. <laughs> it's going to take some... Let's see, how old is she now? She's nine. Nine, by the time she gets married, her dad won't let her get married until she's probably like 40. Right. So, oh, we got time. Yeah. We have plenty yeah, of time. Yeah, but that'll be some expensive. <laughs> this, this took a tangent, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. 910, 75 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at nine. Well, one family got to experience college graduation all together. Together as we continue our great grad series, we're going to continue. We'll introduce you to the Adams family and tell you how they all ended up at college at the same time. Plus, good morning. A group of roadrunners will be competing in a rocket engineering competition against dozens of students from across the world. How their passion is taking them to new heights. Next. After months of hard work, UTSA students are getting ready to compete in the world's largest intercollegiate rocket engineering competition. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from UTSA with what students learn throughout this process and what it means to them to participate in this year's Spaceport America Cup. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning, Stephanie and Mark. Yeah, so much excitement here at UTSA for this competition. They're going to go to southern New Mexico. Really cool stuff. And I want to show you the power. How much? Take a look. This is from last year. And this is, you just, look how powerful that rocket is right there. This year, they're going bigger. This morning, we have Haven and Kevin with the Aeronautics and Rocket Club and Daniel Pineda, Assistant Professor of UTSA's Department of Engineering. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. We'll start with you, Haven. Tell us about this rocket behind you. So uh, this is uh, currently the design's name is Linda. This rocket is uh, a 13-foot airframe designed to go to 10,000 feet uh, in the air. Uh, it is powered by a hybrid propulsion system, with the, which is a significantly more complicated uh, propulsion system than uh, most rockets in this class use. Normally, they use solid motors, uh, which you know, if you've ever laid a firework or you know played with hobby rockets that you know you can buy at any hobby store. Uh, you know, very simple, just light it with like a match uh, or with a match of sorts. This is a lot more complicated. We're using liquid propellants. We're using valves, venting tubes, things like that. Um, this has been a major undertaking for the organization. It has really helped us develop a lot of uh, real world engineering skills uh, as uh, individuals as well. Uh, and we're really excited to compete with this vehicle at uh, this rocket rather at uh, Spaceport America Cup this year. 
And Kevin, back here, you've been also working in a big part of this. Tell us about what you've been working on. My primary role has been working on the launch trailer here. This is a very uh, important asset for us because we need to be able to have something to launch it off of. And it needs to be mobile because we're going from San Antonio out to Spaceport in New Mexico. Um, it's posed a lot of challenges. It's not just a normal trailer that we go buy from the store. We've had to hack it up, weld it, bolt it, and it serves uh, more than one purpose than just launching the rocket, we're able to use it as a, a test stand. We can test for something called a cold flow, but actually this weekend we have it in a configuration for a hot fire, which allows us to test the rocket engine, but make sure it doesn't go anywhere. We don't want it just flying off and causing problems. So right now it's set up to be able to do that. Amazing, now this has impacted the students in many ways. How is that, Daniel? Well, the whole process of like taking an idea from like paper to real flight hardware uh, takes a lot of time outside the classroom and it takes a lot of the types of skills that we may not you know learn in a lecture style course these include things like you know designing it going back to the drawing board because you find out that something's not going to work manufacturing it and then manufacturing it again because maybe it turns out you can't build a part that way testing it and then you might have to reiterate again after that but most importantly, the students are learning things like project management and teamwork that's interdisciplinary. And these are the types of skills that aerospace engineers have to exercise in industry. And by participating in projects like this, students get a chance to practice being engineers. And in my experience, the students who go through these types of projects tend to be more successful at obtaining internships and full-time positions in industry um, because this is the type of skills um, that are really used there different opportunities and that's amazing well congratulations to all of you i'm excited to see how you all do in this competition i know you're going to do well yeah i know you're going to do awesome and rockets are expensive coming up at noon we're going to show you how you can help this team go to new heights we'll send it back to you that's very cool and congrats again tiffany live at utsa thank you good luck to the team all right outside with live cam i heard some chit chat in the newsroom earlier about a sprinkle or two in a few parts of our viewing area? Yes, okay. we have a couple of sprinkles out there. The cloud cover rolled back in this morning, kind of like what we saw yesterday right. morning, really just because it's so humid yeah. outside. We've got yeah. elevated dew points. You can feel that stickiness, uh, stickiness out there this morning. And yes, while very few and far between, we've seen a few pockets of some light sprinkles out there. So let's get you a look at the radar, what we're monitoring out there right now. Again, you can see it's not for everybody, but especially closer to Bear County and especially out just to the west in Medina County, seeing a few sprinkles and yes, even some light showers, some more notable shower just passed through the San Geronimo area and near the 16 corridor and then another little shower just to the north now of Rio Medina that is actually headed closer to the Medina Lake and Lake Hills area. General motion of these moving in from the south and pushing farther up to the north. After this, just a 10% chance for a very stray shower throughout the remainder of the morning and into the early afternoon. The vast majority of us will stay dry throughout the later portions of today. Decreasing cloud cover like we saw yesterday. More sunshine helping highs climb into the upper 80s and nearing that 90 degree mark here in San Antonio into tomorrow. Still warm and in fact pretty seasonable for this time of year. Highs near 90 once again to wrap up the short work week. And as we head into tomorrow night, an isolated storm will be possible out west again later in the evening and into tomorrow night. Most of the day tomorrow is going to be pretty dry out there as well. And then into this weekend as we see that little change in our weather pattern, a few more isolated storm chances are in the forecast. So let's time it all out. Starting off though with a look at temperatures outside and in around the San Antonio area, 75 right now here in town, 77 in Kennedy, 78 already in Catula, seeing a little bit more sunshine out that way, 77 in Del Rio, upper 60s still holding on out there in Rock Springs. We will see more sunshine return into the afternoon. By lunchtime, we've got a forecast temperature around 82 degrees, 87 by 3 p.m., and then a forecast high around 89 by the 4 to 5 o'clock hour here in town. Stepping out for any Thursday evening plans, mostly clear skies later this evening. Temperatures falling into the mid 80s by 7 to 8 o'clock. But yes, our average high now for the first day of June is about 91. So 
we're close to it, if not a few degrees below it here in town. 89 in New Braunfels, that forecast high 88 in Floresville, and then some low 90s possible for the farther south in West that you go later on this afternoon. I mentioned that 10% chance for a very stray shower. You can see that here on our future cast later this morning and into the early afternoon. Very, very low coverage. Most of us will miss out. More of the same in tomorrow, just that isolated strong storm possible across our far western counties tomorrow night. Then into Saturday, we've got a 20% potential for a few more isolated showers and storms, and then we'll bump that up to a 30% potential by the second half of the weekend. And as of right now, that looks to continue in some way, shape or form each day as we head into next week. So this is the setup. We've still got high pressure and control here across South Central Texas, which squashes the rain chance for the most part here in San Antonio. But we've got a few areas of low pressure, one off to the east and one off to the west. As that high pressure system breaks down into the first half of the weekend, a few disturbances moving in on the south side of that low pressure system off to our northwest do look to allow for just enough energy to get some of those showers and storms up and running. Not a washout of a weekend. Don't cancel your weekend plans by any means, but probably a good idea to keep the uh, KSAT Weather Authority app handy just to be on the safe side. And an umbrella. And an umbrella, <laughs> just in case. Thank you, Mia. Time right now, 922, 75 degrees. And it's not every day that you get to attend college with your parents. Also, going to classes on the same campus, but that was the reality for one family family, what that experience was like for them, and what they have planned next for themselves. We've been sharing some great graduate stories from around our area, but you probably haven't heard one like this. That's right. So this is the Adams family, and all three actually got to walk the stage together and graduate from Texas Lutheran University. David Sears shares how they all ended up in college together at the same time, and what is next for this family. Meet the Adams family, mom, Robin, dad, Greg, and daughter, Ashley. The decision for the three of them to attend Texas Lutheran University together didn't happen all at once. It started with Ashley. When she graduated from high school, she decided to continue her athletic and academic career at TLU. Her parents also decided to go back to school at the same place. They asked me if I was okay with them coming here, and obviously I was. I was excited for them. The decision to go back to class came after Greg retired from the Army after 22 years of service. Well, I either need a job or I need to go back to school. And back to school one. Robin went to school when she was younger, but it didn't work out for her at the time. She says she was nervous at trying again, but now encourages everyone not to let their age be a factor. I think it's never too late to go back to school. So just do it. While in school, Ashley didn't have any classes with her parents since she was an education major, but her parents did. Since they were both in business administration, they quickly realized they only needed to be a married couple at home and not in the classroom. We tried that once and oh, it, was it did not go well. Um, no. <laughs> I'm pretty strong headed and she's I am too. Probably more strong headed. The three had a great experience and were excited to walk the stage as a family. It's not every day that you get to see your wife and daughter uh, go across the stage and get their degrees. So what's next for them? Ashley will become a high school math teacher and track and field coach. Robin will be an audit associate for a CPA firm. And Greg got a job working in human relations. Congratulations to all three. David Sears, KSAT 12 News. Congrats. Time now, 927, 75 degrees. And we'll be right back in about three minutes. While progress is being made to get the debt ceiling raised, Monday's deadline is still looming. The agreement hammered out by President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is heading to the Senate after winning strong support in the House. Senate leaders are planning to work quickly to get the deal done. ABC's Justin Finch is following the latest and explains how some members are already slamming the bill. On the House floor, a major win for the debt limit deal. Yeas are 314, the nays are 117. The bill is passed. A true bipartisan effort with 165 Democrats and 149 Republicans voting yes, delivering almost 100 more votes than needed to pass the deal struck between the president and the House Speaker. 
In a statement, President Biden salutes the House vote, calling the budget agreement a bipartisan compromise and saying it protects critical programs that millions of hardworking families, students and veterans count on. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy celebrating. I thought it'd be almost impossible just to get to 218. The legislation agreed to by President Biden and Speaker McCarthy calls for pulling back billions of dollars in unused COVID relief and IRS funding, ending the federal student loan repayment freeze in August, and preserving Social Security, Medicaid, and veterans' benefits. The bill, now Senate-bound, where it faced bipartisan backlash before even formally arriving on the chamber floor. Deficit reduction cannot just be about cutting programs that working families, the children, the sick, the elderly, and the poor depend upon. Instead of confronting this existential threat head on, this deal is racked with complacency and false, cowardly compromise. And right after that House vote, Senate Leader Chuck Schumer took the procedural step of adding the debt limit bill to the Senate calendar. That chamber now has four days to pass it before the Treasury Secretary warns the U.S. could run out of money to cover its bills. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. Let's look out there with live cam warming up a little bit to 76 degrees. I wonder how long those clouds will stick around to keep us just a slightly cooler. Yeah, just a little bit cooler. They are going to burn off as we head into the afternoon, kind of like what we saw yesterday, decreasing cloud cover, more peaks of sunshine, helping those temperatures warm. So the first day of June, it's going to feel like it. Upper 80s, even closing in on that 90 degree mark later this afternoon. Here's a look at the pollen count for the day. Good news is molds continue to drop still in the moderate category. So we've got some work to do, but not as bad as the past 48 hours. Pigweed still in the count for today, but it is low. Here's the latest radar scan. Just a few splash and dash body showers, pockets of sprinkles, pushing through portions of Bear County near Holotus, even stretching over into Medina, Bandera, Southern Kendall County, all of that moving in from the south and farther up to the north. Just a very straight chance after this for an isolated shower before the day is done. 75 degrees right now, a dew point of 70. Yes, we've got the cloud cover in place, but you can see here on your day part forecast throughout the remainder of this Thursday, we will see more sunshine as we head into the afternoon. Temperatures climbing to about 89 degrees degrees is that forecast high here in town by about 5 p.m. And then we'll see those temperatures fall off in the low 80s for any of those evening plans. Tomorrow night, an isolated storm out west into this weekend, still isolated, but a few more chances for some showers and storms start to work their way back into the forecast. That continues into next week as well. So we'll get you all those details, talk a little bit more in depth about it, as well as get you the latest update on our drought monitor coming up in just a few, guys. Thank you, Mia. Let's look out there with TransGuide. Still kind of slow going there at I-10 East, just inside Loop 410, but things are moving. You can see there, they're just moving a little slow. The only thing other than that is some dis disabled vehicles, no accidents. All right, Job Fest 2023 going on later today. It's a big job fair for teens and young adults focused on getting young people employed. People between the ages of 16 and 24 will be able to speak with more than 100 local employers looking for part-time and full-time help. There will also be internship opportunities for those looking to gain meaningful work experience in their career field. Job Fest will be happening from 4 to 7 p.m. later today over at the AT&T Center. And the issues surrounding daycare affordability and access in the U.S. are growing. And the crisis played out at a city committee hearing yesterday. Advocates urged lawmakers to take immediate action to help families struggling to find affordable options. And as lawmakers consider policy changes, seen as Jen Sullivan has some tips for what parents can do now to deal with soaring child care costs. Addressing the child care crisis in America. On Wednesday, a Senate committee hearing focusing on access and affordability. A broken and dysfunctional child care system. With advocates calling for changes to help struggling parents. Data from April's Consumer Price Index shows the cost of daycare or preschool has surged by 7% compared to the previous year. And while lawmakers weigh policy options, what can families do right now? What's getting impacted the most is increased debt for sure, 
and the inability to save enough for retirement. Personal finance expert Julie Alma Tavares has three tips to stretch your budgets. Tip one, explore alternative child care options. Traditional daycare centers and preschools can be costly. Tavares says consider home-based daycare providers or team up with other parents or family members. What we've done is really try to work a schedule that can allow everyone to chip in. Tip two, Utilize flexible spending accounts. Taveras recommends looking into dependent care assistance programs offered by employers. There are these uh, programs where you can put a portion of pre-tax dollars into an account that you can then use towards child care. And tip three, advocate for a flexible work schedule. I feel like especially women, we should be advocating for ourselves to be able to do those things, right? Men too, because men take care of children. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. Today is last day of school for a lot of kids in our area, as we mentioned at the top of the newscast. And if you're looking for something to do to keep them busy, our San Antonio Public Libraries have tons of events scheduled every day for kids of all ages. So each day we're going to try and feature a couple of the events going on around the city. And today you can take the kids out to Encino Library for some fun in the sun with foam, bubbles, and water. So that's going to take place from 2 to 3 p.m. If you're looking for something artsy, you can take the kids to Forest Hills Library for Arts and Crafts from 4 to 5 p.m. This activity geared for children ages 6 to 12. But these are just a couple of the several other events going on throughout the day at different city libraries. You can find a link to the San Antonio Public Library's event schedule on our website at ksat.com. Just look for the KSAT Kids section. 938, 76 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. The NBA Finals kick off tonight between the Miami Heat and the Denver Nuggets. And you can watch the game right here on KSAT 12. So David Sears is going to be back in a few minutes with a preview of Game 1. Welcome back. It's 941 and, um, you know, looking forward to summer break as a mommy. So that's kind of cool. Starts. Mm -hmm. to, do you count today or starts tomorrow? Tomorrow. 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 OK. Yeah, because she still has a full day. I mean, I don't know. Some some schools let out early, but yeah, that is. Well, the good news is for folks that are going to be kicking off summer plans today, tomorrow, not too bad. Not bad. Good pool days, things of that nature. And really, this weekend's not going to be too bad either. We just may need to dodge a few isolated downpours and a couple of rumbles of thunder. But this, of course, follows May, a great month for rainfall, especially when you compare it to May of last year, 3.92 inches of rain. That's how much we were able to officially gather here in San Antonio over at SE International, which is the official climate site for San Antonio. Now the average for the month of May around here is about 4.4. So yeah, we still have about half of an inch that we could have grabbed to get to the average for the month, but also keep in mind that May typically is the wettest month of the year for us here in San Antonio. We did get a new drought monitor update in this morning. We didn't see a whole lot of improvement where we have the worst drought, the extreme and the exceptional drought. This is actually last week's update, but I want you to pay attention to this orange circle. We're going to advance this on to now this morning's update. We did see that severe drought be trimmed out of our far southwestern counties. And we actually have seen a little bit of moderate drought be trimmed out of our far western counties. So all in all, that is good news that we did see some more improvements, but we do still have some work to do in the drought departments. A few showers out there right now. Here's what we're looking at on the south side of Bear County. Here's 1604. Here's 410. That's moving farther up to the north near Palo Alto College, just to the west of Mitchell Lake, a little downpour there. And then we have a few more more showers out in far western Wilson County in between the 181 and 281 corridors there. Also a few more notable showers there just to the east of Pleasanton and Jordanton. So we'll keep eyes on all of that over the next hour or so generally into this afternoon. Most of us are going to stay dry. We'll see the cloud cover scatter out, break up just a little bit more, leading way to some peaks of sunshine into the afternoon around 8. 87 by 3 p.m. here in town. 89 is that forecast high in San Antonio. 86 by 7 p.m. And then later on this evening, those thermometers fall into the low 80s. 89 in Pleasanton across our far southwestern counties. I think some 90s are certainly possible, especially across the Winter Garden area. 94 in Catula, 93 in Carrizo Springs, 87 in Kerrville, and 90 out west in Del Rio. A little neighborhood view here for later on this afternoon. 86 Timberwood Park, 87 in 
and Seguin. 89 over in the Von Army area. All right, as we head into Friday, still going to feel a lot like early June, near 90 degrees. More of the same into Saturday. Again, that isolated strong storm possible across our far western counties tomorrow night. Most of the day is dry. Into Saturday, more of the same, 20% chance for an isolated shower and then 30% chance into Sunday. High pressure and control right now, an area of low pressure off to our west. But briefly, I want to focus on this area of low pressure that's meandering over the far eastern Gulf of Mexico. The National Hurricane Center is monitoring this as well. They've actually given it a 50% potential for tropical development in the coming days. This is not going to impact Texas. It will give some heavy rain to portions of Florida. But of course, this is just a reminder that today does kick off the official start of the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. So lots to keep eyes on over the next several months in that regard. Until then, enjoy the drier weather over the next few days because those isolated rain chances return this weekend and they stick with us into next week, guys. We will. Thank you, Mia. And tonight is game one of the NBA Finals and you can watch it right here on KSET 12. This is the first Finals appearance in franchise history for the Denver Nuggets and the Miami Heat looking to do the absolutely unthinkable. No number eight seed has ever won an NBA championship. Our David Sears is back with a preview of game one. Speaking of Miami, where were you 10 years ago? Uh, was it licking our wounds after getting beat yet. by the heat? Not N yet. Not yet? Because we were, we were just getting ready to start okay. the finals. Uh, we didn't almost. know we were about to lose to the, this right. series. We hadn't had, had game one yet. Okay. Because we were just getting into June. Okay. Ten years ago at this time. And yes. uh, that was still smarts a little bit. But, of course, yeah. the ultimate redemption was the very next year. The next it was the very next year. year. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. ten years ago this year, I think it was in Miami getting ready. I think a bunch here. of us were, weren't we? So everybody's all excited about the series tonight. Remember the Spurs back in 99 went to their first NBA Finals. They were the first ABA team to win an NBA championship. If you don't know about the ABA, Google it. They played with a red, white, and blue ball. This is way back in the 70s. So now the Nuggets could be actually a second team from the ABA to win an NBA championship. And they are led by Nikola Jokic, who is just absolutely fantastic. He has been a just a monster in the playoffs so far. 29 points, 13 rebounds, 10 assists is what he has been averaging in the playoffs. Jimmy Butler is the main guy for the Miami Heat. So those two guys will be going at it. There's a lot of other great players that you probably really aren't familiar with until you watch the NBA Finals because a lot of people don't start watching this until until game one tonight. So, but this is going to be a pretty exciting series. And the reason why we like Denver, the reason why, well, I like Denver, and the reason why I like Jokic is because he modeled his game after Tim Duncan. Ah. He is no Tim Duncan, but, but he modeled his game after Tim Duncan. So this could be a, a pretty, pretty exciting series. Here's both teams talking about game one in the series tonight. This is a special group, you know, that this group has been able to overcome a, a lot of different things, uh, handle a lot of adversity, uh, setbacks, um, things that have not gone the way we wanted it to go. Uh, and instead of uh, having that collapse our spirit, it, it allowed us to develop some fortitude and grit collectively uh, and give us something to rally around, uh, which was each other. Um, and those are, those are special qualities. We know what we're capable of. You know, the outside individuals don't get the opportunity to see that. And I wish that y'all did because then you would see that the guys that we have on this team, on this roster, um, can really play some high-level basketball. And we're going to stay confident because, like I said, we, we're in the, the grind every single day. We have yet to win a championship, and that's why we're excited to be here, but know that we have a ton of work to do, and this is going to be the hardest challenge that any of us have faced in our NBA careers. We, this is going to be the, the hardest game of our life, and, and we know that, and we are prepared for that. We are preparing and prepare for that. So I think there is no favorites. And one of those guys is going to be our series MVP. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And you were, you were talking about, we were talking about Eric Spolster earlier. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. been there for 15 years. Wow. I remember he's, you were reading that uh, LeBron James wanted him fired when LeBron James was there. He did. He wanted, he yeah. wanted uh, Eric out and Pat Riley back in. Of course, Pat Riley's 
78 year old been running the heat for quite a while yeah and i was mentioning to you earlier this is uh pat riley's 19th time in the nba finals as a player assistant coach coach or executive in the nba oh. unbelievable yeah so. All right, Pat, we're still going for the heat, though. Yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm rooting for Denver this yeah. year. I mean, we're going for the Denver. <laughs> yeah. I, where I, got I was like. Right. Um, 7.30 tip-off, game one live right here on KZ12 tonight. So that's be pretty exciting. And, oh, by the way, speaking of NBA Finals, one day we're hoping this kid brings his San Antonio Spurs back to the NBA Finals. He's got one game left over in the European League that he's playing in. If he wins tomorrow, he wins that championship. Right. Then he comes to San Antonio. They're going to draft him on the 22nd. And then it looks like we're going to see him in a Spurs uniform for the first time in a game when they go to Sacramento for some of the summer league play. Mm -hmm. Sacramento's going to open it up on July 3rd and 5th. And then they go to, remember, they go to Vegas. That's the big summer league tournament there in Vegas. But he's going to um, be a Spur. It'll be interesting to see how much time he actually plays in the summer league. Yeah. yeah. Because he's coming off this uh, this run through the through European it, basketball. It will be interesting. And you know, there's already been talk about some of the Spurs legends mentoring him. Yeah. But you knew, you guys know I'm going on vacation in a, a week from today. Oh, yeah. I will be in Paris. Oh. Yeah. There you I'm go. gonna go ahead and mentor uh, why you're be my own way. Why is it? Why you're there? A week. Yes, you sir. Can, you nice. just run into him while you're there. Play the groundwork. You know, call me a yeah. chamber of commerce kind of guy. So <laughs> what a nice do what job. I can. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mark. <laughs> <Really>. <laughs> exactly. And he will say, you are who? <laughs> yep. David, thank you. Thank All right. 951, 77 degrees. We'll be right back. The final episodes of mystery drama series Manifest promises to reveal some long-awaited answers. CNN's David Daniel has a preview of the final season that's set to stream on Netflix tomorrow. When we boarded 828, we had no idea what a tortured, life-changing journey we were about to embark on. Now we're finally at the end. The second half of the fourth and final season of Manifest is finally here. We've been given an opportunity. A reminder of what's most important. I never thought I'd meet so many beautiful souls in one place. It is amazing. It's, it's wonderfully satisfying. It's a long-awaited conclusion for fans, the cast, and series creator Jeff Rake, who originally planned for six seasons. NBC canceled the show after three, then Netflix picked it up for one more supersized season. Ultimately, you get all of the same storytelling, just not necessarily in the format that we originally envisioned. To be able to have him finish the story and, and show it to everybody to its end, I mean, that's 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 really darn cool. This is it. We have no more time. If anybody can rally the troops, it's you. My favorite thing that I've really learned from her is to notice the help that you're getting. It's time to be with the people you love. Hold tight. Yeah, we both know how it ends. We do. We're I'm holding the for secret. everyone else to find out. Yeah, I am. We're ready. holding the secret. It's so crazy. Still waiting for a calling in Hollywood. I'm David Daniel. Looks interesting. Yeah, I remember when it was on NBC. Now it's, uh, now it's been back for a little while now. It's now on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us. Have a good day today.